I'm Carrie Lewis, Executive Director of DCA. We're delighted you're here. Before we begin, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Our series is sponsored by Dahl Law Firm and Ross Estate Planning. We're also thankful for the support of our lodging partner, Apple Creek Resort, and our coffee ho host, Basecamp Coffee. Please give these folks a round of applause. We want to encourage you to come back and join us tonight for a coffee house concert featuring Michael Lee Ammons and the Water Street Hot Shots. Also, we have two lectures remaining in our winter series. We'll be right back here the next two weekends, and we encourage you to visit our website for full descriptions. This morning, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Rebecca McKean. Dr. McKean is an assistant professor of geology at St. Norbert. She is a St. Norbert alum as well. She did her bachelor's work there before pursuing her master's at Northern Arizona University and her PhD from the University of Nebraska. Please give Dr. McKean a warm welcome. Thank you so much. So my typical audience, so I teach at St. Norbert, obviously, my typical audience, uh, I teach a lot of general education courses. So I'm up in front of a group of students who have to take a science class and they don't want to be there. So I'm really excited to talk to a group of people who are coming in on a Saturday to learn something new, which is something my students would never do. So I'm very, very excited to be here. Thank you all for joining me. I'm excited today to talk to you about my research in paleontology. Paleontology is something that I wanted to do since I was a little girl. Um, I just was obsessed with dinosaurs. I couldn't get over it, couldn't get past it, kind of never grew out of it. So I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about my research, what I do, and some of the things that we found in the seaway. So my plan, just to give you a heads up, is to spend the beginning part of our time together talking about this ancient seaway that I work in. It's a seaway that's about 90 million years old. I want to talk to you about the seaway, what we found in the seaway, and then when we come back for part two, I want to talk to you a little bit about how paleontology works, the process of paleontology, how we find stuff, how we excavate it, and how I go about studying it. So that's the plan. So most of my work centers in southern Utah, which is a place that is very, very dry and it is gorgeous. If you've never been out to southern Utah, I encourage you to go, because it has one of the most stunning landscapes ever. Um, some call it desolate, I call it gorgeous. So this is what my field area looks like. This is where I'm at every single summer. Utah today, very, very dry. Clearly not much vegetation growing on the rocks, which is good for me, because that means they're exposed and I can look for fossils but you don't think of it as being a place where there was actually an ocean. And in fact, that's actually the case. 92 and a half million years ago, southern Utah, desert today, was actually covered by a giant ocean, an inland sea that we call the Cretaceous Western Interior Seaway. And this sea was full of all kinds of marine organisms that you would expect to see in places like the Caribbean today. So we see all types of fossils like turtles, we see sharks, we see little squid, we see clams and oysters and snails, and then we also see larger organisms like the plesiosaur that you see on the slide that's sort of devouring the turtle. Plesiosaurs are giant marine reptiles. They're my favorite, so you're going to see my bias come out as I talk about the different types of organisms we found because I absolutely love them. So how did this ocean get there? Uh, this is what the world looked like about 90 million years ago. So you can see a couple of things are a little bit different. The first thing that's a little bit different is that the continents are positioned very different from they are today. So you'll notice continents being a little bit closer together than you might expect or than you might be used to seeing on a typical map. And that's because the continents had relatively recently broken apart from being part of a major supercontinent that we call Pangaea. Pangaea is the most recent supercontinent, when most of the continental landmass was all joined into one big area. About 200 million years ago, that started to break apart. So here we're kind of roughly halfway between Pangaea and where the continents are today. So you can see the Atlantic Ocean is a little bit skinnier. The Gulf of Mexico is finally starting to form. And then Europe and Asia are, are kind of starting to move away to the east as well. 
One thing I want you to pay attention to as well that looks a little bit different is just how much more of the continents are covered with water. So there's a lot of really light blue areas on the map which represent shallow water. And those shallow waters, again, would be kind of like you'd expect off the coast of Florida, how you have really shallow, warm waters. That's kind of what we're expecting here. So there's no ice anywhere on the planet, and that's one of the things that helps sea level be a lot higher when there's no ice that puts that water back into the oceans and causes sea level to rise. And there was another thing happening where seafloor spreading rates were really high. So those were the two reasons why sea level was really, really high. So Earth was a lot warmer. It's kind of tropical almost everywhere. We would certainly not be experiencing temperatures like this outside today if we were in the Cretaceous. Even in Wisconsin, believe it or not, would be warm and tropical. Uh, and then sea level was a lot higher. So one thing to kind of zoom your attention into is North America. And North America has this big inland seaway running all the way from Canada down to the Gulf of Mexico. And that seaway is called the Cretaceous Western Interior Seaway because it formed during the Cretaceous period. So what we're going to do is go through uh, a few million years between friends uh, as we go through time to kind of see how that seaway developed. And that seaway wasn't just there and then gone. It actually kind of formed, got bigger, got smaller, got bigger, got smaller, and then eventually it went away and disappeared. So as sea level started to rise, you can see uh, it kind of coming down from the north, so from Canada, and starting to flood the central part of North America, not fully connected. You can notice, kind of see the outline of where Wisconsin is, where you'd expect it to be. It's pretty, pretty high and dry, safe from, safe from all of the uh, marine organisms. A little bit later, at about 100 million years ago, the sea level started to drop and we got a little bit drier. And then by about 85 million years ago, 85 to 90, the seaway was at its maximum extent. So sea levels were as high as they've ever been throughout history. I put a little plesiosaur in there because again, they were dominating. Clearly they were the best things in the entire ocean. But this is what the seaway looked like. It covered a lot of states that you don't think about having an ocean in now, certainly, because they're basically in the interior of the continent. So states like Nebraska and Kansas were actually completely flooded underwater. South Dakota and North Dakota, parts of Montana, Wyoming, Utah, and uh, New Mexico as well. So huge th states that we think of as being deserts and dry were actually completely underwater. The other thing you can notice is the slightly darker color on the west side of the seaway, and that's because that part of the seaway was actually deeper. So we do have slightly different animals, slightly different types of fossils on the west side than we do on the east side. So we'll go forward again. 75 million years ago, the seaway shifted a little bit, and it kind of shifted out of Utah. So Utah was no longer uh, this big ocean anymore. Now it was exposed above, above sea level. And then by about 65 million years ago, which coincidentally is when we had a giant meteorite impact that ended up killing the dinosaurs and the plesiosaurs, they never get any credit, but they went extinct at the same time. 65 million years ago, the seaway was drying up, so it was almost gone. So this was kind of a short-lived event, and you're sitting here thinking, this is tens of millions of years, how can you consider that short? But in geologic time, we think of a couple tens of millions of years as being kind of a short little period of time. So this is what I study. I look at the seaway, and I look at Utah. Specifically, there's one formation in Utah called the Tropic Shale. So we group rocks that look similar to each other and call, give them names. The Tropic Shale was deposited at that time, if I go back again, to 85 million years ago when the sea level was at its maximum extent and the water was deepest on the west side of the seaway. So one thing I do is I study the fossils themselves. I go and look for new fossils. I try to find new fossils. And the other thing I do is I study how they're preserved. And that, that particular field is called taphonomy. So if taphonomy, taphonomy is probably a new word. Um, taphonomy is the study of what happens to fossils between death and discovery. So the basic gist of it is how are these fossils preserved, okay? So I want to understand a little bit about how we get these fossils preserved in the rock, rock record. And for me, I'm mostly interested in how vertebrates are preserved. 
So a lot of work has gone into studying marine invertebrates, little shells and coral and things like that, because they're really abundant and they're easy to study. We can go out to a modern coral reef and study modern living coral and those living shelly organisms, and then we can kind of understand how they end up being preserved. They have hard shells. It's easy to imagine them being buried and lithified into rock. Vertebrate fossils, it's much more difficult to understand. Some people have done work with vertebrate fossils on land, so the picture on the left is kind of disgusting, but there are some taphonomists that do studies of actual carcasses. So what they will do is take a, an organism, they won't kill it on purpose, but um, there's a researcher in Africa, for example, that has taken carcasses of elephants, as they die, when they die, she goes and takes all these notes about where they were deposited, and every couple months she comes back and looks at how that carcass appears to try to understand how it is preserved over time. Some people do that in the ocean, although it's pretty rare, with whale falls. When a giant whale dies in the ocean and falls to the bottom of the seafloor, it becomes this amazing habitat for all types of other organisms. The deep ocean floor is pretty much devoid of food. So when a giant carcass falls from the heavens, it seems like, all of a sudden you'll have isopods and hagfish and all kinds of organisms that scent that carcass and come to it and use it as a food source and kind of decay it and break it down. So my question has always been, well, how do these fossils get preserved in this ancient ocean? Plesiosaurs and mosasaurs, these giant marine reptiles, can't be that unlike whales. So I'm imagining these carcasses falling on the bottom of the seafloor. How do they get preserved in the rock record? So we can do all kinds of things like you see on the right. So imagine this big marine reptile. It's falling to the seafloor. Somehow its head, its head is, more, is heavier, and so that's sinking to the bottom of the seafloor. The skull kind of uh, starts to dig into the sediment a little bit harder because it's heavier. You've got sharks scavenging on it. Then as you go further, all the soft tissue ends up being decayed, but you have things that are starting to grow on the rib cage because it's a great form, uh, it's a great surface for things to grow on. And then eventually the rib cage falls open, it collapses open as the decay happens farther, and you have more things growing on it that eventually becomes buried. So when we see a skeleton preserved in the rock record, or when I see a skeleton, I'm instantly thinking about how disgusting it was when it was sitting on the bottom of the seafloor. How did it get preserved? Was it scavenged? Were there things growing on it? Was it left alone? Was it buried pretty quickly? Or did it take a while? So that's kind of my big secondary question with my research. So what's the purpose of doing taphonomy? Why, why does it really matter if we know how a plesiosaur 90 million years ago was preserved? The biggest thing is because it helps us reconstruct the ancient environment. I'm actually a geologist in training. So I did my bachelor's degree at St. Norbert in geology, my master's degree was actually in geology, and my PhD was actually in geosciences or geology as well. I did paleontology research, but I've kind of tackled it from a geology perspective. I'm really interested in what the environments were like. So I don't want to just be able to say it was an ocean and it was deep. I want to be able to know more. How much oxygen was there in the water? What was the pH like? Were there bottom currents or was it pretty quiet? I want to know the details about the environment, and taphonomy is a great way to get into those types of questions. Second, since I love plesiosaurs so much, I want to know about their life history, and taphonomy can actually also help us figure out and answer those types of questions. So figuring out how they were preserved helps me understand where they lived, which tells me something about their life history. I study these things called gastroliths, which are basically stomach stones that they had in their stomachs to help them grind up food. I'll talk about those a little bit later. But if I study those gastroliths and how they were preserved in the skeleton, that also helps me understand something about why they had those stones in the first place. And then finally, it kind of helps me figure out if there are biases in the assemblage. If I discover that it's actually really, really difficult to preserve a large marine reptile, then I know that I'm not getting a true indication of what that assemblage looked like. I know I'm not getting a true look at what that population looked like. So for shelly vertebrates, you can find a whole bunch of these different types of shells and know that that's probably about the proportion they existed in. But if I see a plesiosaur here, and then one way over there, and there's nothing in between, does that mean that they were actually rare living? Or do I just not see them preserved? So 
Next, I want to get into what types of things lived in the seaway. And I'll start with the most basic and the smallest, and then we'll go to the most complex and the largest, because that's always a fun way to do it. Why end small when you can end large? So we'll start with tiny little microscopic organisms. The CUA was actually chock full of these tiny little microscopic algae, the same way that the oceans are today. And in fact, some of these organisms are the exact same types of organisms that we might see today in some place like Florida or the Bahamas, these environments that I've been trying to tie it into. These tiny little algae were photosynthetic, which means they were soaking up energy from the sun and converting that into a food source for them. By that, they were also producing oxygen as a byproduct, and they were all over the place. These organisms are called coccolithophores. Those are the ones in the upper left that you can only see microscopically. And then foraminifera, which you see the sort of rounder one in the center there. They build these tiny little skeletons out of calcite. So when they die, they filter to the bottom of the seafloor. If you've ever seen videos of uh, ocean explorers or submarines taking videos, you'll see it's called marine snow. It kind of looks like it's snowing through the ocean water. A lot of that stuff are these tiny little algae. It's also sediment from the land and a lot of poop, I'm afraid to tell you. It looks really pretty, but it's mostly poop. Um, there's also a lot of algae that are kind of filtering their way to the bottom of the seafloor. They'll eventually deposit on the bottom to form this, it's called calcareous ooze, because it basically looks like an ooze. It's really, really soft material. And that ooze actually affected what other types of organisms could live there. When that deposits and it lithifies, it forms a rock called chalk, which we're probably all very familiar with. There are huge thicknesses of chalk deposits throughout the western interior seaway. And one of the most famous is in Kansas, which is a picture on the right. It's called the Niobrara chalk, and it's famous for having huge fish fossils and shark fossils and plesiosaur fossils and mosasaur fossils and turtle fossils. It's really famous for having these big fossil deposits. A different chalk deposit that you might have heard of from the exact same time period is the White Cliffs of Dover in England. The White Cliffs of Dover deposited during the Cretaceous, and just to amaze you, because this amazes me every time I think about it, the White Cliffs of Dover is a huge, huge deposit of tiny little microscopic algae. That's what it is. So if we took a sample of the White Cliffs of Dover and looked at it under a microscope, what we would see is the picture on the left. You would see tiny little microscopic coccolithophores. When we write on the chalkboard with chalk at school, you're scraping tiny little microscopic organisms off on the board. It's kind of exciting. Uh, my students don't really think it's exciting, but I do. Every day it's a thrill to teach. Okay, so a little bit larger and more complex. You have a number of invertebrate fossils as well from this formation, uh, or from the seaway in general. One of those are ammonites, which you may have heard of. Ammonites make beautiful jewelry, and so you'll see them sold at mineral and gem shows and actually at some jewelry stores as well, some rock shops. Basically, when you slice them through the middle and polish them up, they look really, really pretty. Ammonites are related to squid and octopi. So you see in the upper right, that's a reconstruction of what they would have looked like. They had these massive coiled shells and these tentacles sticking out the front. And they were basically feeding on small fish and other microscopic particles they were feeding on. They swam using jet propulsion, so they'd basically take in a big amount of water and then squirt that water out. It would propel them backwards, which seems not functional because you can't see where you're going. I'm not how that worked. And then they had these little gas chambers as well in their bodies that would help control their buoyancy. So they could change the amount of gas in those chambers to either help them sit higher in the water or help them sink lower. And that's basically how they moved around. And these are all over the place. The photo on the left gives you an idea of what they look like. They're actually kind of hard to find in some circumstances because they look very similar to the material that you're walking on. The picture on the right is another example in shale, really tiny, very, very small ammonite shells that were squished and preserved. Beautiful. And they're great for time markers. So paleontologists, even vertebrate paleontologists, actually love ammonites because they evolved very rapidly. So they look very different. So we can look at an ammonite and know exactly what time frame we're in, which is really helpful. We also have clams. 
So this kind of plays into that ooze I was telling you about on the bottom of the sea wave. The clams during the Cretaceous actually looked pretty different from what we would expect of clams today. Mainly they had very, very thin shells and very wide shells. And the purpose for that was they're sitting on ooze. They're sitting on a really soft substrate. And if they're too dense in one spot, they're just going to sink in and be suffocated. So that's not a good thing for anyone. So they would basically expand their shells out and make them really thin to kind of spread their weight out. The same thing you're told to do if you're ice skating and you hear a crack, you're supposed to try to spread your weight out as much as possible. Some of these clams, the biggest clam fossil ever found, is from the Niobrara Chalk of Kansas, and it's five and a half feet tall, which is pretty amazing, with a really, really thin shell. They also have the growth lines. So if you see the lines that kind of grow across, each line is thought to represent one month in the life of that clam. So another kind of interesting thing we can do is actually count those lines and figure out how old that clam was, which is pretty remarkable when you think about something that's 90 million years old, being able to say it was eight months old or it was a year and a half old. That's pretty incredible. Next, we have oysters as well. So kind of similar in the same type of group as clams. These oysters lived in slightly different environments, so they weren't living on that ooze. They were substrates that were a little bit harder, a little bit more resistant. And these are beds that are called bentonite beds, which are basically altered ash beds. So when ash falls on the ocean, that filters its way down to the bottom of the seafloor, and it becomes altered into this sort of clayey substance called bentonite. I had a student work on these oysters a couple years ago. And this is one example of what it, one of those oysters look like. They're informally called devil's toenails, which is kind of a horrifying description for something. But you can kind of get an idea of why they were called devil's toenails. But they basically would sit on the bottom of the seafloor in this cup shape, and they'd have a little cap over the top. They could open their cap to let water, some of that marine snow in. So they let the water plus marine snow in, filter out all the organic particles, and then push the water out. And that's basically how they were feeding. We found huge deposits of these in the formation I work on. Millions upon millions of oysters. It was actually kind of heartbreaking when we were doing her research with her because in order to get to them and study them, you have to just walk over and crunch them all the way to kind of get to where you're going. There's no, there's no way around it. There's just so many that you can't avoid breaking them. And I, from someone who really, really loves fossils, it's horrifying when you break one. It just breaks your heart a little bit. So Amy out there, Amy is actually doing her master's degree right now at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. So she's kind of moved on to great things. And the poster on the top is an example. Uh, she presented the results of her work at the National Geological Society of America meeting. So that was kind of a great experience for her. Other invertebrates, just to kind of talk about some of the other ones. So the photo on the right is kind of an example of Amy's, one of Amy's sample sites, she would cordon off this half meter by half meter square and she would collect all of the fossils within that. So that would include basically all of the little bumps that you see on the picture are all little oysters and snails and other types of things. So on the left you can see some other fossils. So we've actually got snails and we have worm tubes. There's some evidence that there were little crabs, although we didn't find any that particular summer we did her work. So tons and tons of invertebrates, the same types of things you would expect to see today. The vertebrates, so this is where it gets fun. So the vertebrates, there's always a bigger fish, right? So as we kind of work our way through from the smallest to the largest, we're actually gonna go through small fish, bigger fish. We'll talk about turtles. Sharks are not on there. The plesiosaur is the one that's clearly going to escape because it's faster. And then the really large one at the bottom is something called the mosasaur, which is kind of the apex predator of the entire seaway. So we're going to work our way through that food chain. Turtles in the seaway are pretty similar to the types of sea turtles that we see today. So these sea turtles had these big kind of like leatherbacks. They had these big leatherback shells. They would swim slowly through the seaway and they would eat things like jellyfish and squid, they would eat those ammonites if they came upon them, and they look similar to kind of what you're seeing there. The one on the left is one that I found in 2010, I think was the summer that I found that one, 
So that's basically part of the, the shell, the lower part of the shell. And the rest of that one is still sitting in the ground. And I can kind of explain why we would have fossils that we just leave in the ground for a couple of years. Uh, I'll explain that kind of after our break. So what about these small fish? So small fish in the Cretaceous are large fish today. So the Cretaceous a kind of a propensity for things to be really, really large. So small fish were actually anywhere from about four to six feet long. So imagine going fishing in the Cretaceous. Actually, it would be kind of terrifying because there are a lot of things that could eat your boat. So you might not want to do that. But these small fish we call Encodus and Gillicus. Encodus is kind of a neat little fish because it had these really sharp pointy fangs in the front. And we're not entirely certain what they were used for. I don't know what the function would be of having straight fangs hanging down from the front and extending up to the top. Because if you accidentally had an overbite or something, you would really hurt yourself. But I'm not sure what they were stabbing with them or what they were eating, but we know they were swimming around in the seaway. And we also had these little fish called gillicus, and again, little, these were five to six feet long, so that kind of gives you some idea there. And it, when you find them in the field, when you find them in the rock, the upper photo gives you an idea of what they look like. So that one is not in very good condition. The teeth are broken, but you can see that they're all still there. That's a trick, <laughs> getting that out without breaking all those tiny little teeth and losing the pieces is a massive, massive feat. So this is one idea of a, a Gillicus skeleton. For a scale, you can kind of see a roll of big, clear scotch tape in the upper left-hand corner to give you some idea. This one is about four and a half feet long. So for a Gillicus, it's actually kind of a small one, believe it or not. But this we found in the tropic shale in southern Utah, perfectly preserved, almost perfectly preserved, all laid out just like it was in life. So the skull is over on the right side. You can trace the backbone all the way across the photograph. You can see some of the fins coming down, and you see a slight discoloration around the bones. And that we think is from bacteria feeding on the carcass as it's decaying, kind of leaving a little, a little imprint, a little organic uh, coating around the edge, which is kind of neat because it gives us an idea of the total size of the animal instead of trying to guess based on the skeleton. The only thing we're missing, sadly, is the tail. And the tail was eroding out before we got to it. So that's kind of the nature of things. If you want to find something, you look for bone that's eroding already on the surface. So your, your chances of finding something with no erosion, no removal prior to you getting there are pretty slim. But to have everything else is pretty remarkable. There's actually a brand new fish that I'm having a student work on right now. She should be back at St. Norbert working on this over the weekend, actually. And she has tentatively identified it so far as a new organism for the formation that we work in, a little fish called Pachyrhizotis. We've never found this fish before in this formation, so this is really, really exciting. It's exciting for us, and it's ex really exciting for her. She's a senior at St. Norbert College right now. She's applied to grad school, and she's very nervous, waiting to see if she's going to get in, but I know she will because she's a fabulous, fabulous student. So up in, the, up in the right, that's Allison. She's actually on her second research project with me because she did such a great job on her first one. She finished it before she was supposed to be done, which was a good thing. But I said, well, how about doing something else? And uh, she, loved, she loves pterosaurs, actually, so that's what her first project was on, and that's what she's studying in the photo. We did a little project on pterosaur taphonomy, or the preservation of pterosaurs. She presented that at a national conference, and then, yeah, like I said, she did such a good job. I said, hey, do you want to do something else? I know you don't like fish, but how about it? And she's such a go-getter. She said, sure, I'll do a project on fish. She just wants more experience on, in paleontology. So this was one that I found in 2010, brought back and prepared. The vertebra, vertebrae are about the size of a penny, so you can see that in the photo. And then one of the jaw pieces, you can see the teeth kind of sticking up in the top of that bone. So she's working on identifying that right now, but it's definitely nothing we've seen, and she's pretty certain it's Pachyrhizotis, which is pretty exciting. So what do the large fish look like? The large fish, quite frankly, are terrifying. And there are things called Xyphactinus. They're bony fish, they're related to tarpon fish. If we have any fishermen here, they're closely related to those types of fish. And they'd be anywhere from 15 to 20 feet long. So that is a terrifying, terrifying fish right there. 
Huge mouthful of really sharp teeth in the front, so you can see the reconstruction of what one looks like on the left. This is an actual fossil from our formation with the big teeth sticking up in the front. These were feeding on the small fish. We know they were also feeding, sadly enough, on baby plesiosaurs, and they were also feeding actually somewhat on sharks. One of the most remarkable specimens of Xyphactinus is in Kansas. It's at the Sternberg Museum, and it was actually discovered in the early 1900s by the Sternberg. So the Sternbergs are father and son, uh, very famous fossil explorers. And this particular specimen was found in the Niobrara chalk, the one that I've been kind of gushing about. And it's called a fish within a fish. So the big fish that you see is a Xyphactinus. This one I think is only about 15 feet long, so that's not even as big as they can get. And within the stomach cavity, basically between the ribs of this fish, are a small fish, which is one of the, the gillicus that I was talking about before. This one I think is about four, four feet long, I think if I recall. So about four feet long that it clearly swallowed whole, head first, and then both of the animals died shortly after. So the question has always been, how did they die? And one of the ideas, if you look at the reconstruction of Gillicus on the bottom, so that's a Gillicus, they had really sharp fins. So their fins on the top, their dorsal fins, were actually really sharp and pointy, and the back of their tail fins were actually really pointy as well. So one of the ideas for what happened is either the big fish swallows the, you know, the smaller fish whole, and it's kind of thrashing about, obviously, because it's not happy about being eaten, it's thrashing about, and the big pointy fins actually puncture some of the, the organs within the body, and that might have killed the Xyphactinus. The other idea, because of where it's positioned, is that the tail fin actually stabbed up through the roof of the mouth into the brain of the Xyphactinus. Either way, it's basically just a really, really old example of gluttony, right? You're trying to eat something too big, and then what happens? It's not good for anyone. But a pretty amazing specimen anyway. Getting larger and more terrifying, uh, sharks were all over the place in the seaway. Sharks have a really, really long fossil record. They've been around for hundreds of millions of years, and the Cretaceous was no exception. They were swimming all over that seaway through central part of North America. These uh, sharks were anywhere from 15 to 22 feet long, and they include all different types of species. The upper right are just a few examples of some of the teeth of sharks that we found in the formation that I work in. One of those types of sharks is something called Cretaxyrhina, which is informally called the Ginsu shark because the guy who named it thought that the teeth would have been great for slicing and dicing. I don't know if you guys have seen that commercial for the Ginsu knife. Anyway, I didn't do that. That was someone else. Uh, there are other types of sharks, so the one in the right have these really narrow teeth that would have been really good at puncturing things. Either way, these things were doing pretty much the same things that we think of sharks doing today. They were predators, so we know what they were feeding on as well from the stomach contents. So they were preying on things like the Xyphactinus, the big fish, and the small fish. And they were also preying kind of on probably sick animals, like sick plesiosaurs that couldn't swim as well, they were scavenging on them. And they were scavenging on the carcasses. As the carcasses were sinking through the water, they were really good at just kind of picking off pieces, tearing off chunks of flesh as these carcasses, I'm getting really graphic, I'm sorry, but this is how my, my mind, my taphonomy mind works. I think about these carcasses falling through the water. The vast majority of the skeletons that we have from the formation I work in have some evidence of scavenging on them. There's, there are almost no, at least of the, of the more complete skeletons that we have, almost none of them have nothing. Almost all of them have some markings on them from shark, shark teeth. And it's hard to tell whether they were predation marks or scavenging marks, you know, what point on the, in the history of that organism was it being eaten. But certainly we know the sharks were prolific. One thing we don't have from the seaway are shark skeletons. The major reason for that is because shark skeletons are made of cartilage. So cartilage does not preserve very well in the fossil record. It's the same thing that your ears are made of, that your nose is made of. It's this really flexible material and it's kind of softer. It decays really rapidly, unlike bone. Bone is a really hard substance, it preserves easily. 
And so we don't get shark skeletons very commonly. There are a couple really isolated examples of shark vertebrae that end up being preserved. So mostly we don't have actual skeletons. We have a ton of teeth. Teeth preserve well, one, because they're so hard and resistant, and two, because sharks produce many, many teeth within their lifetimes. So it's not even like they have just one row of teeth, kind of like we do, or I guess we have, we have uh, kind of two sets of teeth within our lifetimes. But sharks have many, many sets of teeth within their lifetimes. Their teeth are always rotating towards the front of their jaw, and they're dropping out of their mouths all the time. So it's not uncommon as you're prospecting for fossils, at least in the formation I work in, to see just a tooth, and then you walk a little bit further over and you see a tooth. Teeth are kind of relatively common. And I regret to say that we don't actually collect all of them anymore because there's so many that we kind of, oh, there's a tooth, and then we just kind of bypass to look for something more exciting. That sounds really bad, actually. But we don't, we don't collect everything. It's like if we tried to collect every oyster fossil. There are millions and millions of them. There are a lot of shark teeth. So this is an example of some of those scavenging marks I was talking about. On all, again, on almost every single complete specimen that we have. So if you look on the left, that's zoomed in on a bone, you can see these vertical marks that are kind of scratching down the surface of that bone. And in the top, you can see these almost curved marks that are kind of scratching down. And then on this one, you see these deep gouges on the very left surface of the bone. It's really, really common. And we think that those are from sharks. There's one other special type of shark that I want to talk about before I move on to the really big guns. And that's a type of shark called Tychotis. Tychotis is different from the typical triangular shaped tooth shark, the ones that are really scary. Tychotis was a shell crushing shark. So you can see an example of what the teeth looked like on the left. They were kind of these bulbous teeth that were really flat. Um, excuse me, not flat. They were sort of rounded on the top. And they have these grooves running across. And basically what they, we think they were doing was actually eating shells, kind of like you see in the upper right. So they would have a battery like this, really big teeth in the center, smaller teeth on either side. They would have that on the top and on the bottom. So they would kind of swim along the bottom of the seafloor to pick up those oysters or those clams, crunch them using that massive battery of tooth to kind of break the shell material down, swallow the whole thing, and then they get all the soft bits. These are everywhere. These teeth preserve really, really well because they're so robust. They're really beefy teeth. They're kind of these big, robust balls almost versus the sort of typical triangular shaped teeth are a little bit more difficult to preserve because they're, so, they're a little bit more delicate. But these are really robust. They're easy to preserve. We have several species of this type of shark all over the seaway, which is kind of neat. So another type of organism that we see in the seaway, and I regret to say we actually don't see these in the formation that I work in, but they are almost as neat as plesiosaurs. And they're called ichthyosaurs. And ichthyosaurs are basically these dolphin-like marine reptiles. They were swimming up to the surface of the ocean to get air, just like reptiles do today. And they're preserved some kind, sometimes in just stunning detail. So the one in the upper surface has that bacterial film that I was kind of talking about with the gillicus where we have the whole skeleton, and we also have a complete outline of what the body of that animal looks like. They also had huge eyes, some of the largest eye-to-face ratio that's ever, been, ever existed within the entire history of organisms. The largest recorded eye, at least the eye socket, is 10 inches across, which is kind of ridiculous. The lower left has this thing called a sclerotic eye ring, which a lot of ichthyosaurs are preserved with. You can see an example of it in the skeleton in the upper photo as well. Those sclerotic eye rings, we think, were actually designed to help keep the eyeball in place because they had such massive eyeballs, and when you're moving through water, water is going to have some sort of pressure on that eyeball, and it's going to impact it. So that eye ring, it's kind of this bony ring, was actually designed to help keep the eyeball in place. We know what they ate because we have stomach contents preserved from them, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. So not unlike the fish within a fish specimen that I showed, only this time they're all jumbled up. So that gives us an idea that either these are older stomach contents 
or ichthyosaurs actually weren't swallowing their food whole. They were kind of breaking it down and chewing it a little bit before they swallowed it. We know they were eating squid, so the one in the upper photo there is an example of a straight-shelled ammonite. So instead of those curled ones, it's got a more straight shell, and that's what the fossils look like on the right. And that's what you see kind of within the rib cage of the ichthyosaur on the left. To make it even more exciting, we have some amazing specimens of ichthyosaurs, and this is not the only one. Uh, this one is at the Houston Museum in Texas, so if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend. It's a fabulous museum. They have some amazing fossil specimens, including this one. So what you're looking at, the upper right and the lower left are the same organism. It's just a zoomed-in picture. In the upper right, you see the skull with the vertebrae coming down, and then within the rib cage, if you look really closely in between the rib cage, you see a line of really tiny vertebrae, or two lines of tiny vertebrae, and you see a little skull. And that little skull is actually the skull of a baby. So this is pretty remarkable. This is not, by the way, an example of cannibalism. We know that because there's no acid etching on the bones, on the little baby skeleton, and most of it is kind of preserved almost perfectly. This is actually an evidence, evidence of a baby being held within the rib cage of the mother, an unborn baby, essentially, which is pretty remarkable preservation. To make it even more amazing, there are actually specimens, this one in particular, of ichthyosaurs in the process of giving birth, which is actually what's happening here. So you can see some of that bacterial outline. You see the larger mother ichthyosaur, and then you see the little baby ichthyosaur in the process of being born. The neat thing is that they're being born just the way that dolphin babies are born today, tail first. The reason is that gives them the best chance to get up to the surface to get that first breath of air, right? Because that they're reptiles, they breathe air, just like dolphins are mammals. They breathe air, they need to get up to the surface to get that first breath. Now, of course, it's also incredibly sad because you have to think about the circumstances that led to this being preserved. What led to this being preserved is a mother in the process of getting, giving birth, dying, falling to the bottom of the seafloor, and being preserved. So it's incredibly sad, but it's also this remarkable instant in time that ends up being preserved. Plesiosaurs. <laughs> so plesiosaurs are marine reptiles. They're my favorite because I spend the most time studying them. There are two different types of plesiosaurs. They're very trickily named, the long neck plesiosaur and the short neck plesiosaur. Those are the two types. Of course, the Loch Ness Monster is allegedly a plesiosaur. If that existed, it would make my day. Sadly enough, it doesn't. It's not real. We'll talk a little bit about the two different types of plesiosaurs, long necks and short necks. Long neck plesiosaurs are pretty remarkable. Over half of the length of the body was actually neck. And the main function for this, we think, was that these plesiosaurs were swimming around. They were eating the small fish. And as they were swimming around for a to have such a massive body, because these things are 35 feet long, to have such a massive body, that's going to scare your fish away pretty rapidly. So what we think they were doing was actually kind of stealthily swimming into a school of fish, and the head would reach that school of fish before the fish even knew what was going on, because the body is so far back. Well, that's kind of what we think the hunting strategy was. We actually found the very, very first evidence of long neck plesiosaurs in southern Utah. I just presented on that a couple of months ago at a conference in Denver. So we're very excited because the formation that I work in, we previously didn't have long neck plesiosaurs. They were only in the shallow water on the east side. And we'd never found them in this, in this deep water on the west side. So these are some vertebrae. It's actually all of my evidence right there is, uh, well, these six vertebrae plus one more that's not figured. Seven vertebrae. And I was actually able to tell they were from the back of a very small juvenile long neck plesiosaur. So very, very exciting there. Short neck plesiosaurs, we have a wide abundance in the formation that I work in. Many, many different types of species, including this one, which is called Brachycaenius. Brachycaenius had these really thick, robust teeth that were really good at crushing through bone or crushing through shell, like turtle shell. So we know they were eating fish and turtles. So you can see on the bottom what their teeth looked like. Very thick and very robust. We've also got two new genera within two new subfamilies. So basically two entirely new groupings of plesiosaurs that we didn't know existed before we started working in this formation. One is called Palmulosaurus. That's on the left. And those are what the paddles look like, or the flippers. 
And then the other one is called eopolycotylus. On the top is what the lower jaw of that looks like, and then on the bottom is, is one of the vertebrae from that organism. And then the one that I'm particularly fond of is Dolichorhynchops. And Dolichorhynchops is a small, short neck plesiosaur that would be about 12 to 15 feet long. The bottom is actually a skeleton of Dolichorhynchops at the Kansas Museum. If you've ever been there, it's pretty phenomenal as well. And you can see the difference in the teeth. So the teeth of this one are really kind of gracile, a little bit thin and a little bit more fragile looking. They were actually better for piercing through flesh rather than piercing through bone or something like that. We know from stomach contents that they were eating squid, they were eating fish, tiny things. And their hunting strategy, instead of like the long necks, was actually one of speed and agility. We think that they were very, very good swimmers, kind of zipping in and out of schools and fish, grabbing a fish here and then darting away and then grabbing another one. And clearly able to escape, uh, able to escape any other predator, which is not entirely true, because we know that unfortunately we find plesiosaurs as stomach contents of some other things. Plesiosaurs also had gastroliths, which I mentioned before, which are stomach stones. So the left is what those look like in the field. Everything that has a number is a little small stone that we found within the rib cage of one of these plesiosaurs. And the upper right is just how many you can get from one specimen. Those are all stones from one tiny little plesiosaur, one 12 foot long plesiosaur. Those stones were used either for grinding up food, kind of like birds do today when you see birds pecking at the ground, they're kind of picking up little grit that they use in their gizzard to grind up food. Ostriches do the same thing. Ostriches, by the way, have a gizzard about the size of a football. You know that because I dissected a couple. It's totally normal, uh, just to get the gastrolis out. And then plesiosaurs as well, some dinosaurs on land. They also might have used them for buoyancy, to weight them down in the water, but that's kind of a hotly contested idea. All right, the last ones are the really, really big guns, and these are called mosasaurs. There are a lot of different types of mosasaurs, some of which were actually fairly small, but the biggest mosasaurs got up to about 55 feet long. To give you a point of reference, that's roughly the size of an 18-wheeler, which is terrifying. And I can't help thinking about that when I'm driving down the highway. So as a semi passes me, I'm thinking, oh, what if that were a mosasaur? Wouldn't that be amazing? Scary at the same time. But their skulls were pretty long. Their skulls were about as long as a person, even longer, probably about six to seven feet long. So huge, huge organisms. And they were pretty much eating anything. We find stomach contents of mosasaurs with turtles in them, with fish, with sharks, with plesiosaurs, with baby plesiosaurs, which is really sad, and also with other mosasaurs. We think that they were territorial. They actually were battling each other, not that they were cannibals necessarily, but that they were battling each other for territory. And, well, I guess I would make them a cannibal if they ended up eating part of their, their the loser. Uh, but they were kind of battling it out for space. We just found evidence of mosasaurs on my side of the seaway, the west side, relatively recently. So that's work that was published in 2012. Those are a set of vertebrae along the top and then part of the jaw there on the bottom. Pretty exciting there. Mosasaurs, one of the reasons why they were so fierce and such good predators is because of their teeth. So they had these massive rows of teeth in the front, but another extra thing they had, just because they weren't scary enough, is an extra row of teeth on the roof of their mouth. They're called palatine teeth, and you see that in the upper right. It's hard to get a good photo, but there's kind of an extra dark row of teeth there on the roof of the mouth. And those teeth were pointed backwards, so the purpose, we think, was they're eating something. What they're eating are not scavengers. They are predators. And what they're eating does not want to be eaten. It wants to get away. So if you have teeth pointing backwards, that's kind of able to prevent your, your other organism from swimming away and getting away from you. So what I'd like to do now is take a, take a brief, I think it's time for our break. And after the break, we'll come back and talk a little bit about how do we find these things and get them out of the ground, and that's kind of the plan. So, thank you. So, like I said, the next kind of set of my talk here, what I want to cover is just how paleontology operates, at least for me. So different types of paleontologists might do paleontology a little bit differently. 
But for me, for the types of fossils I study, I want to kind of walk you through the process from the very beginning all the way to publishing. So the first thing that I have to do is uh, find stuff. That's kind of the first step. And I do that in southern Utah, kind of like I've been talking about. So the area that I do my research out of is, it's called Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. I'm not sure if anyone's been there before. There's a big dam there called the Glen Canyon Dam. It's the second largest dam in the US. The largest, of course, being the Hoover Dam. And actually, they're both on the same, same river. But you see where the little marker says Lake Powell. Lake Powell is built up behind the Glen Canyon Dam. And it's a massive, it used to be the Colorado River. And it's now this massive sort of recreational lake that has built up behind, behind that area. So that's kind of where I am. I actually based my work out of the fabulous town of Big Water, Utah. Big Water, Utah uh, looks something like this. Not a lot of big water. But they pride themselves on, on the name for whatever reason. I'm not entirely sure how that name came about. Uh, it's a very, very small town that you drive through. They used to have one general store where we'd go to get ice cream at the end of a really hot field day, and that closed, which was devastating for us because we kind of got spoiled. We got used to our cold ice cream at the end of the day. But this is what the area looks like. So very, very dry, kind of like we were talking about before. And actually, the very first step that I have to go through in order to do this work is apply for permits. So it's part of a national recreation area, which means it's preserved, which means not any, anyone can go there and walk around and find stuff, but in order to actually collect it for studying, you have to have a, a proper permit for it. So my permits come through Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, and some of our work, so if you see on the map, you see the big blue, that's Lake Powell, and then there's a little city called Page, that's where we actually typically end up camping. All of the lime green is Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. That's where we do a lot of our work in sort of the lower sections of that. And then just to the west is that brown shaded area called Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. And sometimes our fossils are found in there. Unfortunately, the line between the two is not well marked. So we usually find stuff and write it down and then later have to go plot it out on a map to figure out which area we were actually in. That's a little bit unfortunate. So I have permits. Uh, they're called surface collecting permits, which basically means I can collect anything within about six inches of the surface. Um, that's allowed within the, the permit that I maintain consistently. And I have that permit it, with a guy called Dave Gillette. He's the curator of paleontology at the Museum of Northern Arizona, which is in Flagstaff. Flagstaff is about two to three hours away from Page. We've added time now because there was a big, uh, big landslide on the main road that we would take to get between Flagstaff and Page. So now we have to go way out of the way. But typically it's about two and a half hours away. And the Museum of Northern Arizona is the repository for all the specimens that we find in Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. So that means that ultimately they all end up there. And the Museum of Northern Arizona holds them and stores them and takes care of them for Glen Canyon. But technically, Glen Canyon owns them. Okay? So I have my permits for surface collecting. So what I do with that, that surface collecting, um, with my collaborator, Dave Gillette, and sometimes I take students out with me as well. The last couple summers, I've been fortunate enough to do that. So we go out to the formation, the tropic shale. And the tropic shale is this black, dark shale that represents a really deep, low oxygen environment along the western side of the seaway. Above it is something called the Strait Cliffs Formation. It makes for some absolutely spectacular scenery. The Strait Cliffs Formation is a unit of sandstone. It forms cliffs that are straight. That's why the name comes in. And the Strait Cliffs Formation is really difficult to do any research in for pretty obvious reasons. It's tough to get to. Even if you did find something, getting it out of there would be really, really difficult. So the Strait Cliffs Formation is a continental formation anyway, so I'm not really concerned with it. So I spend my time in the Tropic Shale. Most of my time concentrate, is concentrated in the lower part of the Tropic Shale. Again, because it's difficult to get into the upper parts. It gets really steep, it's hard to walk around in, and again, if we were to actually find something, it would be really difficult to get it out. So we spend our time in the lower parts. You'll notice a couple of ledges 
that kind of stick out in the lower parts of the tropic shale. Those are those bentonite beds that I was mentioning before. They're basically altered ash beds that we can trace horizontally. We can also date those, and we can use them to mark the position of our fossils in terms of age. So the lower in the section we are, the older our fossils are, and the higher in the section we are, the younger they are. So we use those bentonite beds to basically trace exactly where we are within the section. So as we go out, it's a massive, massive landscape. So my work the last couple of years has been to focus near roads because it's a little bit easier. So we're not allowed to just drive all over the place that we want to. We have to keep our vehicles to the roads. So we park on the road and we basically get out into the traffic shale and we start doing what are called transects. So transect, you basically, kind of like you're mowing the lawn, you basically just go back and forth. So as you're walking, you look on either side of you. So you walk kind of as wide a swath as you're able to visually tell. And you're basically looking for something different. You want to see, you know, it's going to be shale. It's going to look very, very similar. So when there's a fossil, it's going to pop out and catch your eye. And sometimes there are other things that are not fossils that catch your eye. So this is, this is my student, Amy. She's out prospecting, so she's looking in some of the lower sections of the shale. Every once in a while, when she finds something, she stops to pick it up, make sure, see what it is. Nine times out of 10, it's nothing. And then you just keep walking. So you walk, and you look on either side. And when you get to an end, you kind of walk up the hill, turn around, and you look on either side. And you basically just kind of mow the lawn. You walk back and forth as high up as you're comfortable going, looking for stuff. Most days, you find nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing. So it can actually be, I don't know, I think it's kind of calming, actually, because you are just kind of focused, and you're just walking, you're getting some exercise, you're getting some sun, it's not, it's not all bad, it's fine. Usually, when you do find something, it looks something like what you see on the slide. So the picture on the left, are those big areas of bentonite beds that I talked about before with my student Amy. She studied exactly that. So when you're walking across that realm, it's pretty remarkable because all of a sudden, there are fossils everywhere. So all of the little spots that you see, the little rounded ones, those are the oysters, those devil toenails that I was talking about. There's a straight one up in the upper left corner there. That's an ammonite, a straight-shelled ammonite. Sometimes you find the snails and the worm tubes. There's all kinds of stuff in there. Well, that's not helpful for me because that's not where the vertebrates are, and that's what I care about. Usually when we see vertebrate material, it looks something like what you see on the right. So this is a find from two summers ago, and you see the dark brown spots. Those are actually little pieces of bone. So those stand out pretty well when you're walking and you just see black rock, black rock, black rock, and all of a sudden you see a little spot of brown. You stop, and if you're lucky, it's bone. This turned out to be absolutely nothing, which was really sad. Because I was really, you get really excited, as you can imagine. If you've been walking for days, and it's, it's 105 degrees, and it's hot, and you're just really uncomfortable, and then you see something, it all becomes worth it. And then when it's nothing, you just go back, and you think, oh, man. And then you just have to start walking again. So this is basically all it was. There's a little vertebra in the corner, so a little chunk of a vertebra, and then a little bit of a uh, finger bone of a plesiosaur, so it's a tiny little hint of a plesiosaur. And what you do is you look to see where it came from. Usually bone weathers downhill. So if you see stuff in an area, you look up, and you look all around up to try to figure out where it came from. And sometimes you can't figure out where it came from, or sometimes that's all there is. And that's most of the time. So this is what most of our vertebrate fossils from the tropic shale look like. The vast majority of them are just isolated teeth. I talked about the shark teeth being kind of all over the place. You've seen that picture before. These are some of those Tychotis teeth that I was mentioning about, uh, that shell-crushing shark. That's kind of what those look like. Those are all over the place because they're really robust. And then in the upper left is part of a plesiosaur flipper just isolated, it's not even the whole thing, it's actually really weathered. You can see how the color changes. The part on the right was exposed to air for longer and it's kind of fra fracturing and cracking and it's not doing so well. So when we look at our collections, this is mostly what we see. Sometimes you get really lucky. And two summers ago, I had a really, really lucky summer. I 
was there for about two and a half weeks with my student Amy, and she was studying the oyster beds. So she was doing that for most of the time, and the rest of the time, um, once I kind of helped her get started, I said, okay, you work. I'm gonna go look for stuff. And I'll be within eyesight, so we had walkie-talkies. So I'd say, if you need something, let me know, and I'll run right over. And I just was looking and looking and looking for two and a half weeks. One day I found this. So all of the little white spots that you see, those are actually just pieces of gypsum. They're super because they catch your eye. They look like they're something, and then oh, it's just gypsum again, right? So it gets kind of frustrating. The stuff in the middle, right in the middle, there are actually little pieces of bone, and they're actually little pieces of teeth. So I got very excited when I found this near the, near the end of one, of one of the days. Uh, it had been a really hot, really frustrating day, and I found this. And I thought, all right, well, clearly it's coming out of the hill. So let me see what I can find when I start to dig back. And this is actually what I found. It's a whole site full of stuff. So way over on the left are some teeth that are sticking out. And then up, anytime you see sort of a brownish color, that's bone. There's a jaw that extends across the top there with teeth sticking out. There's another jaw coming out over here. That's actually what I found in the first place. And then in the back, that's actually part of the back of the skull, okay? So that's actually what we hope for. <laughs> we get really excited when we see that. The problem is, is that on my permit, I'm not allowed to collect this. I can only collect the stuff within that little zone um, below the surface. I can't actually perform a full excavation on the permit that I have. So that probably extends further back into the hill, I'm pretty sure, but I don't know because I'm not allowed to do that on the permit that I have. So the next step is to take all the notes, take a GPS recording of where the site is, take photographs of where the site is so that I can come back and find it, and then bury it again. So what we do next once we bury it is we apply for an excavation permit. Unfortunately, this takes a while. So to give you an example, that summer, that good summer I was talking about, I found four new vertebrate sites that I knew were looking pretty good. One of them is a turtle, which I showed you earlier. Two of them are fish, including the one that I mentioned my student is studying right now as a probable new, new species that we haven't seen there before. And the other one is a plesiosaur, which I'm very excited about. That one, you can guess, had the highest priority for getting an excavation permit. So we go back and we get an excavation permit. So that was two summers ago. I applied for a permit with my collaborator pretty rapidly. And it takes about a year, if we're lucky. So I had made plans to bring two students with me last summer to go out and excavate the plesiosaur. We wanted to get it out of the ground. The more time it's in the ground, the more kind of danger we see. Because a couple things can happen. One thing is it's sitting in the ground and it's being exposed to all sorts of temperature fluctuations and it's been exposed to water and extra weathering. So no matter how good you bury it, it's going to be exposed to those things, particularly over the winter. Same processes in Utah happen that happen here. Water can get into, you know, kind of seep down into the ground, freezes overnight, expands, you know, that freeze thaw that's responsible for our fabulous roads here, right? Same thing can happen to a fossil in Utah, and we worry about that. The other thing that can happen is it can potentially be poached. This is actually a legitimate issue. There are a lot of people that go out into Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, and unfortunately the areas that I work close to the road, because they're a little bit easier for me to get to, are also the areas that are easy for anyone to get to. There are people that go there and pull stuff out, unfortunately, and don't have a permit, and there's not much that can be done about it. There's actually very little um, sort of park park service or park rangers that are out monitoring the area because it's a huge, huge area. They don't really have the personnel for it. So that's something that we worry about as well. We worry that it's not gonna be there when we come back. So the more time it's out there, the more nervous we get. And I was pretty nervous about this plesiosaur. This plesiosaur was gonna be my next research project, right? And it, since it takes so long to find it and then get a permit and get it out, it's a, it's a big process. If it weren't there, it would have been big problems for me. So I booked plane tickets for myself and my two students, and we made all these plans. We got a campsite. We were all ready to go. I made plans with my collaborator to meet him out there, and we were going to get all set. We were packing up everything, 
And it wasn't until a couple of days before I left that the excavation permit came through. And I was getting really nervous, really, really nervous. Because if I, I mean, we would have had work to do during the time that I was out there. I had two weeks booked. We could have done more prospecting. Um, but if we didn't have the excavation permit, we would have had to just let that sit there for a whole nother year. And that, or I would have had to come up with extra money to come out later in the year. So the permit came through. Our permits somehow, so far, have always found a way to come through, which is great. And we did an excavation. And I'll talk more about that one in a little bit. So this is what an excavation looks like once we find it. The main thing is to get the overburden out. So you can see the, the slope of what this looked like. This is a different one. This was excavated in 2005. This one actually turned out to be a brand new species. I'm sitting there in the, in the orange tank top. So that's the original slope. And what we do is you just kind of cut back into the hill. So it actually involves a, a fair amount of brute force. And then we try to dig around the bone. So if I zoom in from the top, this is what that site looks like from above. And this one's really nice because our bone stands out in good contrast because the bone has this sort of iron oxide coating on it. So the bone sticks out from the black shale really well. It kind of looks like a disaster. It looks like this big jumbled up mess. But this is actually pretty typically what fossil sites look like. You do not usually get the perfect skeleton with all the vertebrae laid out and everything looking like it just fell over and died for you. Everything gets kind of mixed up. But that's, again, part of my taphonomy research is looking at how that, how that all happens. So what you're seeing on the right is the skull. So you see the snout kind of coming down. You can actually see a little bit of the uh, tooth holes called alveoli. And then the skull, uh, the eye orbit, and then the back of the skull, kind of back where you see that rounded object. That's a vertebra in the back. You see some of the girdle elements. So plesiosaurs had big plates of bone over their stomach and over their pelvis to hold in their organs as they were swimming through the water because they were swimming with their stomachs down. You see sort of the long elements that span out. Those are the flipper, flipper bones. And then some of the long curved bones, you can see the ribs in there too. So our goal when we're excavating is to get all this out in some sort of pattern that makes sense so we can put it all back together in the lab. Totally fine. It's not difficult at all. <laughs> it totally is. It's really hard. So everything here is really, really broken up. Glue is our best friend ever. We glue everything like crazy, and we try to take it out so that we can put it back together. So what we'll do is we'll actually start making these little plaster jackets, which you've probably seen before in some Discovery Channel shows or something like that. So we use actually the same thing that they use in the medical industries. They're called, we call them J&Js. They're Johnson & Johnson bandages. They come out in a dry roll with dry plaster coating on them. You tear off pieces, dip them in water, and then kind of conforms to the surface of the bone. And once that dries, you get a really hard cast, the same way that you would if you broke your arm. It's the exact same material that we use. So there you see me putting a cast on a couple of the smaller bones, trying to get them out in good condition. We also use a lot of toilet paper. So toilet paper also conforms really well to the surfaces of bones. We don't want that cast material directly on the bone because it's going to be damaging and it's going to be difficult to get off. So we'll do a couple layers of toilet paper first, wet toilet paper to conform to the shape and then the plaster over the top. So we'll start taking these jackets out. A little bit later in the process, this is kind of what it looks like. We'll try to take smaller jackets off if possible. This one was really tricky just because, as you saw, all the bones are so close, pack, closely packed together that you'd almost have to cut some of them in half in order to get smaller jackets, which we decided we didn't want to do. So you've got a, we've got a couple of smaller jackets over there. You'll start to kind of work underneath and kind of build a little pedestal. And then, well, I think I have a picture of that. All right, so you'll try to build a little pedestal. This is actually that excavation that I was talking about from last summer. This is the, the plesiosaur that I was worried we weren't going to get our permit for. These are my two students. So in the gray is my student, Allison. She's the one who did the pterosaur project and is now studying the fish. She was in heaven to be on an actual excavation. It was amazing. And then the student in the pink shirt is my student, Shannon, who's actually doing research on earthquakes right now. She's an earthquake person, but really loves field work. So she came along for, to kind of participate in this excavation. 
So what we'll do is we'll kind of work around, like you can see they're kind of built up on a pedestal. And this is a little bit further along in the process. We'll try to work that plaster underneath as much as possible. And then everyone holds their breath and no one takes a picture when we try to turn the blocks over. Uh, my collaborator, Dave Gillette, told me a terrible story about this one fossil site he worked on. He worked so hard, carefully plastering around, and when he went to flip it over, everything came out. And that was it. I mean, he couldn't do anything with it. It was totally destroyed. And he said it was devastating. So that, that has instituted the no photos during the turning over of the blocks uh, rule. So that's what we do. We kind of all work together to hold, try to hold the material in and turn it over. And then we plaster over the top. And then the next part is trying to get that to the car, which is not always easy, because as you can imagine, these plaster jackets are really heavy. The bigger they are, the heavier they are. This is one that we transported using a wheelbarrow, which actually works pretty well. So you just kind of put it on the wheelbarrow and wheel your way around through the shale to try to get it to the car. Other ones we've put on tarps and then had six people dragging the tarp. It's exhausting and really difficult. This is another reason why we try to stay pretty close to the road. <laughs> the further away from the road you are, the farther you have to carry it. So the less far, the better. So we try to get it out of the field. So I've painted this sort of fancy picture of how great field work is, and it really, it really is a joy. It really is. I actually really enjoy field work a lot. But to put it in perspective a little bit, field work actually is pretty uncomfortable. It's really hot. Southern Utah in the summers, which is the time that I can go because of my teaching responsibilities, well over 100 degrees every single day. And yes, it's a dry heat, but it's still horrible. 105 on any sort of humidity is just terrible. Sun's beating down on you. There's no shade out there. No shade because there's no vegetation. There are gnats that are biting your face. They just do not stop. They go inside your ear, like inside your ear canals, up your nose. It's horrible. They're biting you like crazy. Uh, and, you're, and you're working on rock that is black. So you can imagine how cool of a temperature that is. It's horrible. It's really, it really is not comfortable. But I will say, when you're actually working on a fossil, when you're doing something, you're working on something that's 90 million years old, that no human has ever seen before, and you're, and you're looking at it for the first time, literally all of that stuff goes away. The times when I'm most uncomfortable is when I'm not finding anything. But when I'm actually working on something, I'm, I'm happy as can be. We camp when we're out there. So this is my campsite two summers ago with my student Amy. And we thought, wow, this is just great. There's a tree. We can come back to shade. How excellent. Just a few hours later, this is what our campsite looked like. So it had uh, rained, torrential downpour. And in Utah, when it rains, that water basically flash floods because it doesn't soak into the ground very well. It flash flooded right into our campsite. That was our first night, first night there. So I said, Amy, we're going to a hotel. And that's what we did. So we did at least one night in a hotel. Usually my budgets can't afford hotels. The camping is a lot cheaper. Uh, but we did one night in a hotel that night to kind of dry out. Unfortunately, this actually ended up causing a more serious issue. And that as we're out there, there is one road to get across into Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, and it is a dirt road that crosses a creek. When we see weather like this, the really dark storm clouds, that means that Waweep Creek, the creek that we cross, turns into this, which means we cannot drive across it. So this is our road. We're supposed to go straight across. And the next morning, after having a comfortable night in a hotel room, which is rare when you're doing field work, we drove 45 minutes out to here to see this, to know that we were not going to be able to get across that day and probably for the next couple days. That's a really, really frustrating thing to happen because it's expensive to get us out there. It's expensive to pay for the tickets. It's expensive for us to pay for all the camping and the food and everything. And we have a very limited amount of time. That's usually the thing that concerns me more. We had two and a half weeks to have Amy collect enough research for her project, to have me look for stuff, to find something, because if I don't find something, I have to wait another year. I already know it's gonna be a year before I can excavate something. 
So missing time is really, really frustrating. By the next day, it looked like this. So a little bit better. You can see some tracks as though some people actually did make it across. In my rental car, I was pretty sure I didn't want to attempt that crossing. So we did not. Actually, instead that day, I said, Amy, take your shoes off. We're just going to go right across. So we tracked across and we managed to do some stuff. Most of the stuff that we do is another 20 to 30 minutes down that road once we get across the creek. So we weren't able to do too, too much that day. But the next day we were able to get out. So we lost about two days there. Which has ended up being fine because I ended up having a really, really good field season. Amy got all her work done and I found a whole bunch of new stuff as well. Okay, so the next step once we get this is to start preparing the fossils. So when we prepare the fossils, they look something like this. We bring these plaster jackets back, and the goal is to get rid of the rock and to glue all the bones together. So this is an example of the turtle fossil, kind of step by step as we go through. And that's when it's just about done. Everything still needs to be glued together a little bit. The preparation, to give you some idea, for an excavation that took me two weeks, took me about nine months to prepare, and that was working almost obsessively a lot. So the preparation takes a long time. Many, many hours in the lab compared to the amount of time that you have in the field. And then the next step is finally we get to study things. So this is the plesiosaur that we excavated in 2005. That's the skull that might look kind of familiar. Well, that's what it looks like in the field. By the time I've prepared it, this is what it looks like. So those are some of the teeth from that particular fossil. This is the skull after I've actually identified some of the features. This are, these are some other elements of the skeleton, the lower jaw on the bottom. You can see I've been counting out some of the teeth. We've got the scapula, some other elements of part of the pelvis. I mapped all of that out into uh, a map using photographs from the field site. We also take really detailed field notes of exactly the positions of everything. Every single bone gets a number, and in this case, every single gastrolith or stomach stone gets a number. So all the little dots in red are actually stomach stones. And then I used this research for my, uh, or this map for my taphonomy research to try to figure out where things were placed and to see if I can reconstruct a whole burial history for that fossil. These again are the stones. You've seen this picture, 298 stones from one fossil, which is pretty, pretty unique and pretty exciting. This fossil turned into something pretty remarkable. That fossil turned out to be a brand new species. So Dolichorhynchops tropicensis is what I named it. It had never been known before. So that was a really exciting opportunity for me. Finding it in the formation that I found it in actually pushed the entire range of that genus or that group of organisms back by seven million years, which is again, pretty exciting for me. And then those gastrolists that I talked about, these are actually the first, this is the first skeleton of a short neck plesiosaur with a full collection of gastrolists. We've known for a while that short necks have gastrolists. They've only ever been found with four or five. Well, long neck plesiosaurs have been found with hundreds and hundreds. And this is the first time that we had a full collection and a full set. That actually led to a complete separate paper there. So the last step in this entire process is to publish. So this is just an example of one of my papers that I got to put out um, in 2011, which was in the journal Cretaceous Research, naming my new species. I got to do another paper specifically on the gastrolus. But the main point of why I wanted to put this in here was kind of from start to finish. Just to give you an idea of how long it takes, this specimen was excavated in 2005, and it wasn't published until 2011. So this process takes a really long time for when we find something to get the permits to excavate it, to excavate it, to prepare it all together, to study it, and then finally to publish it. it takes a really long time. So I usually kind of have things in the, in the mix. So the next thing that I'm going to do is study this plesiosaur that I've been talking about. This is what the uh, skull looks like. So we have a complete skull, which is amazing. It's about this big, which is really cool. I don't know what it is yet because I have to actually get down and study it. Like I said, we excavated it, excavated it last summer. And it's actually been sitting at the Museum of Northern Arizona, being held there in its big plaster jacket, two big plaster jackets, for the last year. 
Uh, I didn't bring it back to St. Norbert College this year because I don't know if you guys have heard, but we're actually currently undergoing a massive renovation of our science building, which is very, very exciting. Included in that renovation is going to be a new fossil preparatory lab that they let me design, which is great. And I didn't want to bring that skeleton back during the renovation. We had massive fluctuations in humidity, which is not good for bone, and massive fluctuations in temperature, which is also really not good for bone. So I didn't want it sitting in the building while it was undergoing renovation and had no real safe place for it to be. So they've been holding it for me for the last year. My plan is to head out this summer to drive it back. It's too fragile to actually be shipped back and it's too big to carry back on a plane. So I'll be flying out, doing some research at the museum for a little bit, and then actually driving that specimen back to put it in the new prep lab, which will be done in June, while the rest of our building uh, won't be done for another year. But that's my next plan, to study that, and I'll continue doing field work and in involving students as much as possible. I know how much those experiences meant to me when I was an undergrad. They made a huge difference in my development as a scientist. So I'm really excited to keep involving students. I've had some great ones so far. And I guess just to wrap it up, acknowledge St. Norbert College, who've been really helpful, particularly with the, with the new prep lab that I'm going to get and funding for some of my research. Museum of Northern Arizona, Dave Gillette is my collaborator that I mentioned. And Janet Whitmore Gillette is the collections manager there that gives me access to everything. I'm actually a research associate at that museum, so that gives me access and allows me to bring those specimens back to St. Norbert. And then Glen Canyon and Grand Staircase, where I do my work. So I would be actually happy to spend the remainder of the time answering any questions that you might have. Yes, absolutely. That's a, it's, it's tricky. So funding, as, as we all know, is kind of hard to come by right now. So I have applied for a number of external grants to get funding to get me out there. Most of it so far has actually come internally from St. Norbert. And then I just try to do things as cheaply as possible. I still have to apply for that money. Um, but I'm in the process of submitting a three-year grant to the National Science Foundation to try to get funding for myself and for a number of undergraduate students. So yes, I can apply for funding, but it's difficult to get. Did you? Yeah, I was wondering if this uh, research that's uh, so unique is only limited uh, to the areas you've been working in, or does it exist elsewhere in the world, enabling you to share this research to a global uh, scientific community? That's a fantastic question. So regarding if it applies to other areas, so there are not very many people that study plesiosaurs globally, and I know them all. We're all, um, <laughs> we're all, in a sense, friends. Uh, if you work, let's say, if you work in an area like dinosaurs, there are a lot of people that want to study dinosaurs, and it can actually get a little bit vicious. But um, people that study plesiosaurs, since there's so few of us, we all get along really well. I've had them share manuscripts with me that haven't even been published yet, which is something that would not happen in a lot of other fields. So there are people that are doing this in Canada on the eastern side of the seaway. There are a number of people that are doing that. And then there are people doing this. There are actually plesiosaurs in Antarctica. There are plesiosaurs in South America and Australia. Um, so my work does apply. I could do it elsewhere, but I've kind of found my niche my area that no one else is working, and so it's kind of my, my open area. Yes? Uh, does St. Norbert now have, or will they have with the new renovation of the, or the new lab, will they have an open area of display of your work or, mm -hmm. or any other fossils? Great question, yes. We are going to have a museum that's not going to be finished until the second year, so it'll be another year. But we're going to have fossils and mineral specimens on display in there. I'm not sure exactly what else. I know one section that I'll be responsible for that will include some of this stuff. And a cool thing about the prep lab is it actually is going to have a viewing window. So similar to like you would see at some of the bigger museums, you can actually walk by and look in and see what I'm working on, what my students are working on and I'll probably be there working on stuff for particular events if they ask me to, to be around for that. So there will be stuff that people can actually come and look at. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
What type of uh, fossils could we find here in Door County? I understand we were under a warm Carl Sea at one time. Yes. Yeah, you were under an ocean. So your ocean is older. Your ocean is about 400 million years old. So you wouldn't have the big vertebrates like we see from the Cretaceous, from the 90 million year old. But I was talking to you, someone who had found all kinds of different fossils. So there are all kinds of different coral. I mean, you can probably answer actually better than I can, right? You said you found a bunch of stuff? Oh, you haven't identified them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this used to be, it used to be basically a coral reef, which is why you have limestone and dolostone and those types of rocks here. So coral is one of the big ones. And then you can find brachypods, which are little sort of lamp shells that would open and close. Things like crinoids, which are sea lilies. They had these um, stems that would come up and these fans that would wait. They're echinoderms related to starfish. Uh, those are the big ones I can think of. I'm sure there are other ones. Yeah. Okay. Could you explain why the sea wave formed from north to south? I always had this idea that it formed from the gulf up. Right, so the question about which way it formed. So from north to south is one idea. So you have to keep in mind that those reconstructions are sort of one person's idea based on some of the research for where that came from. But one of the ideas is that there was its own circulation within that seaway. And so that colder water was kind of being circulated down. It did come from the north and from the south and then kind of met up in the middle. The only thing that controls that is basically elevation. So as sea level rises, it's what areas are the lowest, those are going to be the places that are flooded first, and the areas that are highest are going to be flooded last. Other questions? I just wanted to know how many students you have uh, in your, under, are you teaching undergraduates? Yeah, St. Norbert is a primarily undergraduate institution, so I only work with undergraduates. And how many students do you have in the geology program at St. Norbert? Our geology program is actually increasing in size right now, which is really exciting. So we used to graduate about two or three per year. We actually have seven seniors graduating this year, which for us is a really big number. That's a lot. But I actually chose St. Norbert specifically because it only has undergraduates. Um, that was just the experience why well, I went to St. Norbert for my undergrad and had a really, really positive experience. It jump-started me for my, my research and my excitement for science. So I really, I wanted to contribute that. That's why I wanted to work somewhere like St. Norbert. I, I'd never thought that I would actually be able to work at St. Norbert. So it's been really fun so far. I love it. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Dr. McKean. We appreciate you being with us today.